By 1786, the composer Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart had left the service of the Archbishop of Salzburg and had been in the Austrian capital of Vienna for five years. In that short amount of time, he'd made quite a name for himself, both as a composer and as a pianist of formidable gifts. But certain things still eluded him. Despite the Emperor Joseph II's fondness for Mozart, he still couldn't land a royal commission. And despite the success of his German opera, The Abduction from the Seraglio, he had yet to give Vienna an example of his genius in the arena of Italian opera, still the mark by which any composer of opera was to be judged. According to one of his many letters to his father back in Salzburg, Mozart went through hundreds of librettos looking for just the right subject and found nothing. But just when he was about to give up, he had the opportunity to meet the newly appointed court dramatist, Lorenzo da Ponte. And after he finally discovered a French play that he thought would make a sensation as an opera, he presented the idea to da Ponte and they dug into it with gusto. The play had only been written a few years before, in 1778, but was not performed publicly in France until 1784, only two years before the premiere of the opera. The play's production was delayed because of its incendiary subject matter. A servant in the household of a nobleman sets out to outwit his master and succeeds. Even the Austrian Emperor Joseph banned its public performance as a play, but thought differently about it when da Ponte cautiously presented it to him as an idea for an opera, an Italian opera. For this, the emperor acquiesced and ultimately found the work quite to his liking. The opera, Le Nozze di Figaro, The Marriage of Figaro. I'm Nick Ravellis, and this is Opera Talk. Enough suspense. That French play, of course, was Le Mariage de Figaro by Pierre Augustin Caron de Beaumarchais. The young Pierre Caron was quite a character. His father, a clockmaker, and a born French Protestant converted to Catholicism in order to improve his business prospects, dragging his young son along with him. And so Pierre began as a maker of timepieces, but was also a rather fine harpist and flutist, a diplomat, a spy, and a playwright. He made his money, however, through a partnership with a royal banker, making enough money to buy a noble title, that of de Beaumarchais. But when his banker friend died, he got swallowed up in numerous legal challenges, a couple of which landed him in debtor's prison. It was through the prism of these life-changing events that Beaumarchais began to write his wittiest plays, the Figaro trilogy, scathing accounts of contemporary society as he saw it. The first play was Le Barbier de Seville, the Barber of Seville, written in 1772. But as he was thrown yet again into jail the night before its opening, production had to wait until 1775. It premiered at the Comédie Française that year and was the world's first introduction to these classic comedic characters. Figaro, the barber and jack of all trades, Count Almaviva, the young nobleman whose servant, Figaro, helps to marry the girl of his dreams, Rosina, the beautiful young ingenue under the protection of the miserly, doddering Bartolo who wants to marry her for himself, and Basilio, Bartolo's henchman who also happens to be a music master. The play was so successful and these characters so indelible that a sequel was in order and in 1778, Beaumarchais completed Le Mariage de Figaro. To this new play, Beaumarchais added the characters of Susanna, Figaro's fiancée, who is now the target of Count Almaviva's lust, and Cherubino, an adolescent page to the Count whose hormones are beginning to bubble over. The problem with the play was certainly not these wonderful characters, all of whose roots can be found in the Italian commedia stereotypes, Colombina, Arlecchino, Dottore, Pantaloni, and so forth. And one of the primary themes in those marvelous Italian commedia plays is how the servants get the better of their masters. But it must be remembered that every character in the commedia plays is from the same class. Aristocrats don't appear in them. With Beaumarchais's Marriage of Figaro, we have something completely new. A member of the serving class who upturns the world of a member of the ruling class. 
It took six years and many visits to the state censors before the play could finally be produced in 1784. And once it was, it ran for 68 performances, becoming the most successful play of its time. From all accounts, it was Mozart who first proposed the idea of setting the marriage of Figaro as an opera to da Ponte, but it must have been with some trepidation. What a risk to write an opera based on a subversive work within the context of a monarchical society without any certainty that the work would be performed. Only a composer who believed deeply in his project could have withstood the intrigues of the court and the threats of the censors that the marriage of Figaro was about to face. Da Ponte and Mozart must have worked very closely together on all three of their projects, not only The Marriage of Figaro, but Don Giovanni and Così Fan Tutte as well. We know this because there's no existing correspondence between these two men. Musicologists deduce, therefore, that they were in such close collaboration during these periods of creativity that there was no need for their letter writing. Following the completion of the score of Figaro in early 1786, Da Ponte, according to his memoirs, went directly to the emperor himself to present the case. He promised to extract anything that might offend good taste or public decency, and then he assured the emperor that the text would be morally inoffensive. I can't help but think, since Da Ponte was still using the clerical title Abate, that the emperor was given a sense of confidence by the poet's ecclesiastical status. But Joseph finally agreed, saying, Good, if that be the case, I will rely on your good taste as to the music and on your wisdom to the morality. Send the score to the copyist. You're probably wondering why the emperor himself, the emperor of Austria, always seems to be so personally involved in these theatrical intrigues. That's because he was personally the director of the court theater. Joseph approved every detail of theatrical life at the court and cared deeply that all entertainments exhibit his own beliefs in the philosophical tenets of the Enlightenment. And in the opera The Marriage of Figaro, he didn't see it as a story of the clash of the feudal and aristocratic classes. He saw it as an example of bourgeois morality outwitting a misguided and immoral despot. This played right into Joseph's political reforms, especially his reform of the noble class. The opera premiered at the Court Theatre on May 1st, 1786. It was an instant success with the audience, which demanded more and more encores at the ensuing eight performances. Because this was at the end of the opera season, it didn't have much of a run, but was revived in Prague the next year and remained in their repertory for six months. In the Czech capital, Mozart was lionized and celebrated as the great genius he was. The setting for the opera is Count Almaviva's castle in Seville, where preparations are being made for the wedding ceremony between Figaro, Almaviva's valet, and Susanna, the chambermaid of Almaviva's wife, the countess. The count is determined to seduce Susanna by reviving the dreaded droit du seigneur, the right of a nobleman to spend the first night with the subject bride. Figaro, of course, is furious and determines to thwart his lord at every turn and enlists the aid of Susanna and other characters that we'll meet later in the opera. Let's first turn our attention to the countess. She is pensive and distraught when we meet her, feeling that her husband, Almaviva, has been neglecting her. When her maid, Susanna, informs her of the count's intentions of seducing her, the countess swears to help both her and Figaro in their attempt to outwit the count and teach him a lesson. But thrown into the mix is the count's page, Cherubino. Cherubino is a young man who is attracted to just about every woman he meets, but he's particularly fond of the Countess. We should note here that in the opera, Cherubino is played by a light mezzo-soprano, even though the role itself is a male character. We call this a trouser role or pants role, and in Mozart's time, it was a gender-bending tradition that audiences found quite amusing, even erotic. But the practical reason for trouser roles is simply that it's virtually impossible to find adolescent boys of that age 
who can actually sing these roles. And it's just easier to find women who have the right physique and the right voice for them. There are other characters in the opera, most importantly Marcellina, the Count's housekeeper, and Dr. Bartolo, the Count's medical doctor. Marcellina has extracted a promise from Figaro to marry her in lieu of a repayment on a loan. And Dr. Bartolo wants to help her make sure that this promise is fulfilled because he holds a grudge against Figaro. One more character is Basilio, the music master, who acts as a kind of henchman to the Count. Now, you may be familiar with many of these characters from Rossini's Barber of Seville. Remember, too, that the Countess is none other than Rosina from that opera, now a couple of years older, wiser, and hoping that she can rekindle the love that the Count once had for her. All of these characters are thrown into the comic mix, and yes, the Count gets his comeuppance, but not until all of the loose ends have been tied up. The opera is funny and touching at the same time, but mostly an enjoyable romp through Beaumarchais' satiric look at late 18th century Borés. <laughs> Let's spend a little time with Beaumarchais and with his play, Le Mariage du Figaro. Uh, in order to do that, I've invited Cynthia Stokes, stage director, arts educator, and she happens to be the curriculum specialist for San Diego Opera. Cynthia, welcome. Thank you. Good to have you here. Um, and good friend, I might add. Uh, tell us a little bit about the play itself, the Beaumarchais play. How, how was it accepted when it was first produced and first written? Well, one of the things that I think is remarkable about, about the play and, and also about Beaumarchais' life was that really the plays themselves and Figaro himself really are a footprint of Beaumarchais' own life. And Beaumarchais was in and out of trouble, made and lost fortune after fortune after fortune and was censored and put in jail and, and really seemed to manage to live sort of on both sides of keeping the aristocracy happy and yet really being a man of the people. Um, what happened when, uh, when Figaro was uh, first conceived, Barbara of Seville had uh, ultimately been a huge success. And uh, mobs of people came out of the theater and screamed at his door to, to congratulate him. And so, of course, then everyone wanted a sequel. This is, this is the story always. And uh, a number of people in the aristocracy actually uh, approached him to say, well, what what else can we do with this Figaro? And so the beginnings of that started to gestate right after Barbara of Seville was, was initially thought of. Also, uh, Beaumarchais was always interested actually in the operatic possibilities of Figaro. And so you'll see, even in the play itself, there's quite a bit of music. Well, there's lots of music, there are lots of songs. Right. Yeah. And that was his nod of sort of, it's a play, it's an opera. It's a well, play and I with think music. even Barber was presented to an opera company yes. as a libretto first. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So he always had that in mind. Uh, so he writes a draft of it, and of course, there are all these censors. And the play is soundly refused because it, it questions the role of aristocracy and about what, uh, what a count may or may not do. Now this is the big thing that, yes. you know, that I don't think contemporary audiences really understand because we don't live in that kind of a monarchy. Right. Um, we live in a democracy here in the United States and, um, you know, it, the marriage of Figaro was considered terribly revolutionary and very threatening. In, right. in, in so many ways. First off, because it questioned the right of whoever the senor was to ravage uh, a woman on the day of her marriage. The other thing that I think is particularly revolutionary about it is the fact that the count in the course of the play and in the opera is really soundly taken down by his servants and his wife. Mm. One of the things that I think is so interesting about this piece is that really the women who at that time were considered property are very much the ones that move the story forward. They're the ones that plot. I mean, Figaro comes in and out, but, but we see in this piece too that Figaro's master is love. Mm -hmm. And the women are really the ones who are wiser and, and continue to forgive, and, but really see sort of beyond just the day-to-day the -day of things. So the whole question of whether this uh, count, whether the count is allowed to ravage Susanna, who is Figaro's bride-to-be. And, uh, and at the time, this was, you know, something that was that was considered just done. Well, I think by that point, at least by the the time of the late 18th century, this this 
particular, ravaging. This right. the droit du seigneur is what they called it. Uh, didn't wasn't active anymore. Um, and I think perhaps that's one of the things that horrified audiences as well, that that, that itself was considered right. still. But even beyond that, it was a metaphor for all of the other things that were allowed for the aristocracy. So, so even though that was just you know, a comic example, it, it really uh, heightened that division between what, what people who, the people who had versus the people who had not. And really just by virtue of the fact that you happen to be born into a family of wealth versus being born into peasants or serfs made you uh, or gave you access to all sorts of rights that you didn't have as a common man. Now, I've always been interested in the fact that these are essentially commedia characters. Right. I right. mean, you can really smell the connection between commedia dell'arte and some of these characters, especially, and that is a major difference. Right, especially with the secondary characters. I mean, if you look at Basilio and you look at Bartolo. And Marcelina. Absolutely. Well, she changes, which is so interesting, because she really starts off as, as this grotesque, you know, this kind of old hag. And over the course of the story, she really becomes this this wise woman, this this may, uh, uh, this kind of amazing mother figure who has great vision and warns her son, you know, what about jealousy? And oh, I'm above that, I'm above that. And of course, he isn't. Yeah. <laughs> the interesting thing though is of course that in Commedia, although you know, the servant is always outwitting his master, mm -hmm. the master is never a nobleman. Right. And that's the big difference with the Bon Marche. Exactly, exactly. But it's interesting that, you know, the, if you, you could also say the Count's behavior is not noble, and so that that sort of evens the playing field. And that's the very reason that Joseph II ultimately mm -hmm. accepted uh, this this play being done as an opera by Mozart exactly. and da Ponte. So what happens, so Beaumarchais writes this, and uh, it goes through one censor, and they, and absolutely not, uh, uh, and he petitions the king, and they get a second censor, and a third censor, all, six censors, I think, totally, and the king keeps saying, absolutely not, I, we're not going to do this play. But he does allow Beaumarchais to do readings of the piece himself, which, of course, because Beaumarchais was was such a performer in his own way, he would, for a fee, come and quietly read the play to a salon of people. In fact, the Queen of Russia even invited him to come and read Figaro for her. Fascinating. Very interesting. So it got around. It certainly did. It certainly did. <laughs> okay. um, and uh, ultimately, uh, I think it was about five years before the revolution, the piece was was finally done. There had been, you know, attempts before that sort of secret productions that the king or somebody would find out about and then shut down. I actually think I remember there was a Comédie Française production that on the day of the show was discovered and and was canceled. So it really had a hard time and, if, and, and really was not performed that much, but it was certainly uh, in, in kind of a sub rosa way known by everyone who was was anyone that this was this was very interesting and and also you know inflammatory. Cynthia thanks so much for being with us. My pleasure. Above all, Mozart sought theatrical truth in writing music to perfectly communicate the story. What does that mean? Well, that through purely musical means, Mozart will always try to tell the truth about his characters. If a character is angry or happy or agitated or melancholy, we'll know it through the artistic choices that Mozart makes. The problem being, again, that we're so overly familiar with his style that we tend to forget to really hear those choices. Take Figaro's aria, Se vuol ballare. Figaro has just learned from Susanna that his boss, Count Almaviva, is going to attempt to seduce her on the very night of her wedding. Figaro is furious, brimming with anger. So how does Mozart communicate that anger? With a minuet. You're kidding, right? No. Listen to the text. If you want to dance, little senor count, I'll play the guitar. Yes, I'll play the guitar. The text is, of course, filled with sarcasm and irony. He's essentially saying, you'll dance to my tune, my little friend, not the other way around. There's that noble versus servant thing again, what the whole opera is about. So what dance rhythm perfectly characterizes the world of the nobility? 
the minuet, of course. That was the dance at court. Servants danced folk songs and folk dances like Lendler's. They didn't have the physical carriage to dance a minuet. So Figaro's minuet is blunt and graceless, but the tune is so catchy we hardly notice. This is what's in the accompaniment. Winds alone, no strings, playing staccato. When the voice is added, singing the tune, we don't really notice the dryness of the accompaniment, and a good Figaro will seethe while he's singing this aria, so there's no question as to his feelings. Se vuol ballare, signor Contino, se vuol ballare, signor Contino. Sorry for the voice, but you get the idea. We get so caught up in that wonderfully balanced melodic line that we forget that this is one of the bitterest arias ever written. Here's another example, very interesting one, that, that of Cherubino, who has the famous aria Voi che sapete in the second act. The Countess and Susanna are teasing Cherubino, and the Countess, knowing of his very strong feelings for her, gets him to sing a song that he's written for her. Shyly, he approaches, Susanna plays the guitar, and Cherubino launches into his aria. Now understand, as I've said before, Cherubino is an adolescent dealing with the first blush of sexual feelings for the women around him. The music needs to reflect that, as well as the fact that Susanna is playing her guitar, and that the Countess is trying to hold in her laughter at his innocent but overwrought composition. And he's dealing with the hormones that must be raging through his body at that moment. Does Mozart actually get all that? Yes. The guitar is in the lower wind instruments with a kind of plucking sound. And every once in a while we hear gentle laughter reflected in the upper wind instruments, passages like this. And Cherubino's hormones, Mozart very cleverly shifts from one key center to another in the accompaniment, an accompaniment that would be simply impossible for guitar, but works beautifully for the orchestra. And that constant key shifting gives us an almost unconscious feeling of adolescent trauma, as Cherubino himself shifts from one foot to the other, wondering if the beloved Countess realizes that his feelings aren't just affection, but lust. Such simple means of communication are the stuff of Mozart, but we always have to keep our ears open to really comprehend what's going on deeper. The surface, as I say, is so beautiful, it's far too easy to be distracted. <laughs> Even though Le Nozze di Figaro is well known, it's always good to bone up on an opera before you see it in the theater, if for no other reason than to remind yourself how wonderful it is. But there's an embarrassment of riches in terms of Figaro recordings, so I'm going to be ruthless and just present a few. My first choice of recordings has got to be this wonderful recording conducted by Georg Scholte on London Decca, featuring Kirite Kanawa, Lucia Pop. Frederica von Stada, Thomas Allen, Samuel Ramey, and Kurt Moll. 
I love the tempos, the performances, the gleaming sound of the London Philharmonic Orchestra. It's just about perfect. Another wonderful recording, if you truly want historical voices in their prime, is this 1957 live recording from the Salzburg Festival, Karl Böhm at the helm, with Elisabeth Schwarzkopf as the Countess, Irmgard Seyfried, one of the finest Susannas ever, and a young Dietrich Fischer Dieskau as the Count. A very enjoyable recording indeed. For a recording with period instruments, you certainly can't go wrong with this newest release, conducted by René Jacobs and starring Véronique Jean, Patrizia Cioffi, Angelica Kirschlager, Simon Keenlyside, and Lorenzo Ragazzo in the principal roles. As usual, Jacobs conducts his Concerto Cologne instrumentalists in a realization that brings Le Nozze to new life, but it's not for the traditionalist. This is a whole rethinking of the score with period performance practices informing every moment. It's truly theatrical and gives you a new sound world in which to explore music that you thought you knew. It's a very provocative entry. But if you want something a little bit more standard that's also historical instruments, try this one on Archive. This is conducted by John Elliott Gardner. The Figaro is Bryn Terfel. The Susanna is Alison Hagley. And the Count is Rod Guilfrey. It's a wonderful recording and just a little bit more standard than the René Jacobs. For DVDs, I've got to point to this relatively new release of Le Nozze di Figaro, conducted by Zubin Mehta from the Maggio Musicale in Florence. It's a wonderful production, widescreen surround sound. It looks and sounds fabulous, and the performances are quite wonderful. Out of all these resources, I'm sure you'll find something that will help you get yourself back into Le Nozze di Figaro and enjoy it one more time. The climax of the marriage of Figaro takes place in a formal garden of the Count's castle, a garden much like this one we've been enjoying today. Now, not to spoil the ending, but I will. After all the nonsense of this one crazy day, the Count, having either learned his lesson or realizing that he's finally got to acknowledge his mistakes, gets down on bended knee for his wife's forgiveness. In one of the most touching moments in all opera, the Countess does indeed forgive him and the opera ends happily. It's one of those moments that reminds me that opera, like all great art, is a reflection of the human condition and can tell us in an entertaining and uplifting way what it means to live and love in this world of ours. I'm Nick Ravellis. I'll see you at the opera. <laughs>